Okay, we're on. Okay, cool. So, this is by, uh, her name is Andrea Jasper, and she does a lot of real estate stories. She does a lot of stories. She's a co-worker of, of JR. She's a good friend of mine. And uh, one day she said, I'm going up to do a story on Hulua Loa. Do you know anybody I can talk to? Meaning like a real estate story. So I called Chick and Dinah and the Kunataki Ohana. I said, meet Andrea. Just talk to her about you growing up, being coffee farmers, and she wove it in to make the most beautiful story about Hulua and talking about how they were very poor as kids, you know, and how they all, because the coffee business, you know, 40 years ago, everybody was yeah. wealthy in, in many ways, but poor in terms of the coffee yes. bringing in the income. Agriculture was so it's like so this. wonderful that they come back and there's gourmet coffee, but not without a lot of hard work. They had to re plant their crops and everything. So here you go. Get that to know that family. Lot. Huh? That I really want you. you to get to know them I, and someday go to visit them. That means a lot. So we'll get started here. Do you know, no. This is for? This is for the uh, radio show. And it's to be about how long? Uh, when we stop, 15 minutes maybe or whatever. Okay, what no, do you want us to talk about? You'll see, we're just like we always do, you never know, <laughs> right? Well, yeah. so you'll see. You don't want to start so, in on a shaggy dog story if you're not yeah. going to get to the tail. <laughs> so it's the Emily T. Gale Show here on ESPNHawaii.com. And last week I had a wonderful show with John and Judy Collins, the co-founders of the Iron Man. They developed and created it back in 1977, 78 in, on Oahu. And we've had some very in-depth conversations that are running on uh, the Emily T. Gale Show on ESPNHawaii.com. And, of course, you can pick, pick them up as free podcasts on iTunes and also on Facebook and uh, at ESPNHawaii.com, the past shows are there. And they were, they haven't been in Kona. They were in Panama last year when I talked to them. They're coming back from Panama. This year they're in Kailua, Kona, and that's where we are right now. They just got here Monday. Last week when we had the show, they were at Oahu visiting some of their friends and where they had lived and uh, swam with the Waikiki Swim Club and everybody else. And so it was fun. They arrived Monday, and it's Wednesday now, the Wednesday before the Ironman. And I'm with uh, J.R. DeGroote, who's with West Hawaii today, and my good friend Lotus Bolden, who's also finished an Iron Man, and has Bye. great admiration for uh, the <laughs> Collins. And Michael is also with us. Michael Collins is doing the Iron Man this weekend. He does it every five years. His first one was when he was uh, about 18 or something. We were talking about that. But I really wanted to find out. I, I was walking across the street last night. So all of a sudden, I heard Lima Madero say five or eight. Uh, athletes from Panama, and I thought, oh, John and Judy are probably walking with them because you John were and Judy right. Way uh, to go, Emily. Panama, started the Panama Ironman. That's where they kind of they sailed their boat on the way to New Zealand and ended up in Panama. <laughs> the story. Actually, we were on the way to Europe. <laughs> to Europe. And, up, uh, and, they, and the tax system got messed up. And uh, turns out that in 1992, Panama was like Hawaii was about 70 years before. So you fell in love with it. We city. fell in love with it. And the humidity of the It was a Hawaii you could drive to. We've done that three times from San Diego to Panama. It's a long way. It? Okay, well, and it brought out some wonderful stories, and it, it turned Panamanians, is that the right word? Panamanian. Panamanians. Uh -huh. Now, I remember when there was only one athlete, and now it is a part of the Ironman series and, and the, you know, the tradition of Ironman. And you have done so much to inspire the athletes down there and even get them to be a little more conscious of clean water. But what I'm curious about, I saw how many people were giving you love and aloha yesterday in the parade. And what's it been like for you to get back here and see people and, and get the, the love and aloha? It, it's old home. And this, this, we always feel we've come home when we come to Kona, even though we only come home every five years. <laughs> when Michael or Kristen, the first in the family to do the Kona Ironman, decide to race, the parents want to watch the action, and that's why we're here. And what a blessing, because all the athletes that grew up, you know, learning about Iron Man that didn't ever get a chance to meet John and Judy and know some of the history of it and everything, it's, it's such a blessing, I think, to keep this part of the history, uh, the continuity. Uh, yes, and it's getting harder and harder because it's being spread further and further around the world. And as it spreads and as the years go by, the, the story changes and it, it gets it gets adapted to whatever story the journalist, excuse me, Jr. <laughs> is writing, and that gets quoted the next year by the next journalist who's putting his or her own twist on it. So by the time you get 35 years out, um, you wonder maybe there really were a bunch of drunk seals sitting in Honolulu. <laughs> hey, let's go See, around the island. You know, I, think, no. I perpetuated that myth myself a bit. You know, I think we all did because whoever thought it would become what it's become. And so we kind of told it as a, uh, you know, a little 
Yes, somebody told Val Silk that years ago. Okay. Right? And she was being credited with being the originator of Iron Man. And she said all she cared about was to make it clear that she inherited it. All right. So she she wrote that story. I asked her a few years ago, and she said we'd never met. We didn't meet until a couple of years I, later. I didn't realize yes. that, but we've talked about so that. It, but she did it in good faith. It was good faith yeah. hearsay. But um, it, we have no idea how the SEALs part Probably got because her boyfriend at the time was a Navy SEAL. Maybe that all got weaned in or something. No, no, no it no, wasn't no, until no, much later. Oh, really? Okay. Not at that time, but she, uh, Val always liked the military. As a matter of fact, one of her ideas was that she was going to try to start it by having people jump from the deck of an aircraft carrier. Uh -huh. How would that, that That's 120 feet. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's like diving off a waterfall. Well, on the show last week, and I, I rerun it, and uh, it's a very in-depth conversation with John and Judy about how the Iron Man, you know, the all the kind of the years leading up to it. And Michael, we just talked about it a little bit for the for YouTube, and and uh, you know, it, it, do you have a short a con short uh, version of it? Or you can take the long version if you want, well, if you do have time. But we've just been repeating it to one of the original Iron Man, okay. who's really forgotten a lot of how it started. My version and John's very slightly, but I've been thinking of triathlon since Michael and Kristen and John and I first did the run, bike, swim that was called a triathlon. 1974. In 1974. Uh, first family to finish it and so on. And then wow. we explained to our swim coach while we, why we had skipped master's swim practice that night. Well, and Wednesday. we described what we had done. And he said, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard of. And then behind our backs, in our, in our view, he added a triathlon to a sports fiesta that summer. Uh -huh. The Coronado Optimus Triathlon from 1975 is now the longest running triathlon in the world. And by the way, he was a SEAL. Okay. And he was a SEAL. Maybe that's the connection. <laughs> so um, then we came out to Hawaii, and for some reason, there was a West Coast list of swims that went from Hawaii to, you know, practically to, uh, well, to San Francisco. And Michael and Kristen and John and I entered the Waikiki Rough Water Swim, though to my knowledge, we'd never swum more than one mile in the ocean. The La Jolla Rough Water was a one mile swim. Right. And we got out here. Why we thought we could do 2.4 miles, I don't know, but, but we in loved my, it. In my case, it was easy because you can just turn right and go to the shore. If <laughs> That's right. But, but what we found out was that when we got here, we got terribly sunburned because we were used to swimming mm -hmm. in the cold Pacific Ocean. And you got out of the ocean when you were cold. You didn't get cold in Hawaii. Right. So you stayed in until you got tired. Huh. And that was a new concept. Huh. And we looked like lobsters when we got out of the water. Well, it's amazing to think where it has all come over the 35 years. I mean, when Michael and I were talking earlier about people saying doing that thing, and that's kind of what people used to call it, right? The thing. It wasn't really a sport. It was like, why would you do that? You we, know? We, we, went, we were not really distance runners until we got involved with the Honolulu Marathon Clinic. I mean, we ran five miles, that sort of thing, but to train for a marathon, we didn't really think about that until we got into Dr. Jack Scaff's Honolulu Marathon Clinic. And when it came time to try to get people to sign up for the Iron Man in uh, well, late 77, early 78, we asked uh, Dr. Staff if we could make an announcement on the stage after he give, gave his talk to the people there. And he said, eh. He said, that's not a sporting event, that's just a media event. Oh, isn't that interesting? <laughs> yes. And we hadn't had one yet in Hawaii. Yeah, there hadn't yeah. been a triathlon of any distance yeah. in Hawaii. And that's the part that people forget. It wasn't about creating an Iron Man distance of anything as much as it was at creating a concept and, and creating a lifestyle. Well, as in, you were doing. in our case, we were parents of two children in high school. We were members of two or three clubs, and we were bound to have to volunteer to be in charge of an event, and they had already assigned to us to be in charge of a run swim at Alabama Lagoon Beach Park, a sprint. No way on earth could we ever even place in that event. We were just too slow. I was 39 when Iron Man started, John was 
42. 42. So we had found out we could last all day. Just don't make us go fast. And we thought there were a sufficient number of people who had done the Waikiki Rough Water and finished the Honolulu Marathon in the middle of the pack that they might be interested in the novelty of doing both in one day and connecting it with a bicycle ride. Little did we know that Gordon Haller had done a what in, in uh, 1978 in the Honolulu Marathon? 229? Something unbelievable. Under 230 in the Honolulu Marathon. Wow. That's and, right. and that's a real under 230. That's not a Paul Ryan under 230. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I think in those days a lot of people were starting to understand that we have different metabolisms. You, you know, you either that slow twitch or fast twitch. You know, you would like sprints, you like long distance. I found I was a long distance runner and I decided that's how I like to live life. I like to like plod through it. You know what I mean? It is. It is a kind of a mindset. Well, how did you hear about Iron Man? Uh, we read about it in Barry McDermott's story on uh, the airplane driving, flying home from the Honolulu Marathon where we were here promoting the Emily Detroit run. We would come to the Honolulu Marathon, we would park a Ford outside the Hyatt and put a sticker on it that said, Emily Detroit run. You come know, to and the cold. We recruit people to come to our June run. People thought we shipped the car over. Those were early days of doing different kinds of promotions. So if you did anything that was out of the box, you were pretty unique. Yeah. We were pretty unique. So we did a lot of promotions. We were riding home on the airplane. We read hit Barry McDermott's story in, in Sports Illustrated. And we thought, boy, we could turn that into a promotion. And we did. I was talking earlier. We had the whole city guessing my finishing time. Now, we did train for it. Great idea. And uh, people got an all-expense-paid trip, the winner, to the Ironman the next year and worked in the press room with us. And You mean we, the person who guessed, guessed our finishing finish time. time? Yeah. We did it. You now that's to, promotion. You went into a Ford dealership or an American Airlines ticket office. But they used to be all over the city in those days. And and, uh, we were, and the other thing is we had promised Valerie we would try to get people to see it as a sport. It was known in California but not in the Midwest. So we're, we're kind of our media background. Well, you, you, you know about the promotion. In 1979 we are getting ready to do the second one. And we were looking for a little bit of help. Because we lost $25 on the first one. Been there, done that. With a five dollar entry fee. Oh my God! The second one, people were looking for real T-shirts rather than bringing their T-shirts over to our house and having a silk screen the logo on it. And then the next day, if they finished, we'd silk screen finisher. I love and that. I still you think never that's a told good me idea. That story. Oh, yes. I think that's a great I idea. I like that. Story. Anyway, we were really local, so I went to Hawaii Visitors Bureau. I note that uh, Tourism Hawaii is a sponsor for this year. Yeah. But in those days, I went up and talked to them, and they said, no, they said, we have more tourists than we want that time of year, and this is in February. Than we want. And people are going to just come over and borrow a bicycle. Summer for the University of Michigan, but tell us a little bit about his career at, in, in triathlon over the last few years. He's doing a lot of the uh, half marathon, or half iron stuff and what was it, 26 million on the Big Island this year? Yeah, so. and, and I, I know that's got to be a true story because I, I know some of the history of how convention girl used to think and stuff. They even used to think that way about golf. Golf was not thought of as being as something that uh, brought tourists to the mm -hmm. islands, even when the Montelani Senior Skins was held. It was always underwritten by the Montelani. And then, because nobody in the legislature, the governor, nobody played no, golf. No, not. But, the, but this happened sport again. fishing was big in Kona fishing at the was, time. Was the thing. And, and the rest of the island was like this. Yeah. And I was involved with renewable energy promotion around the island, uh, public meetings, Keahole Point, all of that. I would travel over here. And before the Honolulu Marathon, I would go to the King Kamehameha Pool down at Keahole Point and scrape off the scum have a cup of water. <laughs> so I would have the energy of in the footsteps of the King's Runners. Oh. <laughs> Remember that? That's Judy Collins. Is, is <laughs> joking, that's right. Judy Collins, Judy and John is who we're speaking with. And, and I recommend it, Michael. Michael. Uh, it's the co-founders of the Ironman Triathlon. We're in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. It's Ironman Week. And Judy and John and Michael get here every five years. Michael does the race every five years. And Judy and John, of course, the support crew. He's here with his wife, Kari, they're celebrating their 37th? Oh, uh, 27th. 27th, wedding anniversary. And uh, those stories, are, I love, every time I talk to you, I get new stories. JR, any any questions, any things that come to mind that you might want to ask the Collins? I just wonder, how have you guys seen Kona evolve with the marathon through 35 years? I mean, nothing was here 35 years ago. That's right. I did, same sea wall. Yeah. And the same good swim down there. Because we flew over here with one of the swimmers who, who had a 
seven islands in one day airplane business. We flew over here and did the first uh, Papuna. Papuna swim. Rough water swim, okay? Yes. Uh -huh. And I remember it was so still downtown, so mm. pleasant, just to sit on the wall and take a swim and hope that a wave would crash on me. Um, it's been up and down. We, you know, Kuna seemed more prosperous about 15 years ago, uh, but the, there are new restaurants where the other ones have um, have folded, and we always. Uh, Look to find some of the same places. Yeah, yeah. But when Valerie Silk brought the Iron Man over here from Oahu, and we never thought that it would get very big because in Oahu, we never thought of closing roads and doing that sort of stuff. You had to fit in with the ecosystem, and the ecosystem yeah. included a lot of tour buses and that sort of thing. She was bright enough to bring it over here, and it was fortuitous because that was exactly the time that the pineapple industry collapsed. And all okay. of a sudden, there was, was massive it, unemployment was over here. It was, it was plenty. Yeah. But it, it, it was a good time yeah. for it to come right. here. And it fortuitous because Herb and I had gone to trying to get the streets closed in Detroit for the Emily Detroit run. And I started with 100 runners and it grew to thousands and thousands. Eventually, we were co closing, closing off the tunnel to Canada and all the expressway exits. So we had to, now that's we had to really international write, connection. Write, <laughs> Proved to the city that it was worthwhile in those early days because cities didn't have runs. But you think this mm -hmm. is back in the 70s and 80s. So when we said to Bowery, you got to get the highway closed, she said, oh, they'll never let us close it. We said, we'll write you. If economic impact study you can take to the state legislature, which Herb and I did, I really should give him credit. And the whole concept was you're getting people off the highway where there had been some accidents during the event. Mm -hmm. and, and you get them into the town, which was a sleepy little town. You keep everybody in the town and people would be spending their money. So that was what it was based on in order to get the highway closed. And that was the model and for so Valerie many said, years. Oh, you'll never make that happen. We said, listen, we got it done in Detroit. We think we can write it in a way that they'll buy into it over here. Well, we did it in Panama in 98. We started one, the sole purpose of which was to show the country of Panama what triathlon was and how we could bring people in. And eventually we had Paula and... And, uh, Scott Tinley, Scott Tinley and, and lots some of the Canadian people, Olympians Canadian from men, Australia. And, and uh, we, were, yeah. we were set up bringing in the Mad Dogs from St. Petersburg, uh, Florida. Uh -huh. and so we had a plan that would bring, end up bringing in a couple of thousand people plus support. It never actually got there because, well, we got tired. But, yeah, well, that's but, but, but and it, we went. Did, it did ignite the spark but in the existing runners and bicyclists, and I think now that the 3 million population in Panama has more Ironman finishers, not necessarily a per capita, per capita, mm -hmm. because it was a seed waiting to be planted, just as it was in Honolulu and in 1978. do start with a big vision, and then you just keep... But we got, the same, we got the same response. We went to the Panamanian tourism development thing, and they basically said, go away, don't bother us. We have an election coming up. And in 98, we were here for the yeah. 20th, and we were featured by NBC. Yeah. And we tried to get Panama to let us represent Panama and give us a flag. No, we had to have a friend send <laughs> and, us. And now the new model is to go to the country and to sell them of what has what been can shown be done. all yeah. around the yeah. world, and now they're showing off the country. And oftentimes, what happens, and I, you know, we went through that in Detroit too, where it was like, go put this in a park, and we were like, no, I'm trying to prove that the streets are safe to run through. That's why we want the run to be through the streets of Detroit. There had never been a run in, in Detroit downtown now. But wow. what often happens is we have to pull along behind us the concepts, and then eventually people mm -hmm. think they kind of they they thought it up. O oftentimes, they don't really know what they can do to take the biggest advantage of it. You know, I think that you even said the route that they had in Panama the first year could have been better. Even the swimming was done in a place that wasn't really safe to swim because of the, the uh, pollution. And that I love that you, that we're talking with John and Jim Collins. It's the Emily Gale show here on ESPNHawaii.com. We're also with Michael Collins, who will be doing the race this week, the Iron Man here in the beautiful Big Island of Hawaii. And J.R. John DeGroote from West Hawaii Today is with us. And, and the whole concept that, uh, I forgot where I was, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that you have to, have to sell people on, on the impact it'll make. Absolutely. You it's talk hard. To Convention bureaus and people, they're used right. to their traditional, the way it used to be done. Visionaries are always fighting the, the tide, I think. And, you know, you're going upstream when you're a visionary. Well, J.R. just asked about 
how, how we look at Kona after the sport. And I want, want you to know, JR, one of the things that we've noticed from the beginning, Iron Man started in the Pacific Ocean off an island. And the championships are in the Pacific Ocean off this island. And I think it's rare now to have a triathlon swim in the ocean. Uh, you know, lawyers get involved and liability, yeah. and oh my gosh, a wave might break or mm -hmm. the seal something. Might, a seal, seal might, might bite you. Yes. Yes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so you know, you love the part about the clean waters. I mean, to weave that into what you're saying, mm -hmm. you know, as you're saying, there's not a lot of events in the oceans. They're in in waterways mm -hmm. or lakes. And well, everything. the one that we started in Panama, and and then we did a special one on the 500th anniversary of Columbus having run into the Americas and where he anchored his ships and so on. So one day the sponsor said, well, if you're going to have it, the swim in waters where Columbus anchored his ship, he last anchored right over in this bay, and we have three beautiful forts, we're going to move the swim over there. The sponsors wanted it, because old forts make right. good backgrounds. Very polluted. It was polluted when Columbus was there in 1502. <laughs> and we, who started this event, Michael has done it, had had to boycott it because it was in these filthy waters. And we weren't the only ones. And people didn't people made their own decisions. And everybody knew that wasn't water to right. swim in, yeah. whatever the sponsors said. So the but next year they moved it if you really, back to clean water. If you really want help moving the government and the business community, just get a whole bunch of doctors and lawyers and people that will spend four thousand dollars on a bicycle involved. <laughs> <laughs> so they can push. That, that changes everything. You know, I think also uh, Lotus Golden is with us, a, a good friend of mine, and Lotus is a, uh, an Iron Man finisher. And she came to the Big Island because she lived in New York and was an athlete, was real involved with a Dick, with Dick Traub, who works with uh, disabled athletes. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Lotus Achilles was involved Track Club. Way back, in, way back when, and. Um, uh, what's his name from the New York Roadrunners Club, uh, the, your good friend, Corbett? Uh, oh, Ted Corbett. Ted Corbett. Uh, Fred LeBeau was our good friend, and Lotus and I found out that her good friend was Ted Corbett, who was, of course, a long-distance like runner. Yes, yeah. well, one, my greatest joy from the whole Ironman phenomenon is that two 1980 Ironmen, Bob Babbitt and Rick Kozlowski, ended up starting the Challenge Athletes Foundation uh -huh. to buy a what do they call it? A, 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 a van. A van. A van that's right. For one of their friends who'd been in, injured in a bicycle accident. And they had money left over. So they threw it in the pot for the for a foundation and for other people. And this has enabled more people who are mm -hmm. missing limbs mm -hmm. uh, to to get fitted mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and get active again. Mm -hmm. And it it's just a delight to me mm -hmm. to see that there are so many people with what I call custom bodies now, whereas all of us here have stock bodies. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but differently able. Yes, and this grew out of their uh, enchantment with this endurance sport when they came out in 1980 to do the. What most people don't realize, though, is in the 70s and 80s, is disabled and physically challenged, whatever we want to terminology. Uh, we're not allowed in most events. The Boston Marathon, they had to sue to get into the Boston Marathon, even into the Honolulu Marathon, it was a challenge. I think I've told you we had the Ironsides division in the Emily Detroit. Oh, line. that's that's a great thing. Because we thought, hey, we're going to let wheelchair athletes. We remember in. that TV program. And, and, yeah, <laughs> so you know, we had a lot of people who were just in chairs, not athletes, but their parents would push them. You know, our encouragement was to, mm -hmm. for as many people to come on down. And with the Leader Dog uh, School for Blind used to train out of my store, Emily's across oh, the really? street downtown. So some of them came and ran in the race. Mm -hmm. So the whole front of the race was people that were differently challenged. Well, Rick and Dick were in the race last night. Oh, well, when there's somebody, there's uh, in somebody, the parade last night. Somebody yeah, yeah, some. Right, Rick and Dick were yeah, there, and some. Val did not want to risk right. their safety, and she had said they couldn't do Kona, but I think they were featured in People Magazine one year. 1987, uh, Lynn Van Ert up in Ironman Canada admitted them to the Penticton uh -huh. race, and Val was there, and John and I were there, and Chris and Scott, and we saw how the athletes reacted when they're going over the same course, sure. and and a man is pushing and pulling mm -hmm. his son through that whole race, and mm -hmm. everybody just looked at it and said, mm -hmm. wow, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can do it. And, and it mm -hmm. was so inspiring mm -hmm. that, that 
people and that was change the whole their point. minds. That, that was, was the whole, whole point, thing. was to integrate people into the lifestyles mm -hmm. of everybody, no matter you know how they're living their life. And fortunately, it's happened in schools well, and happened the, the, in the sports. Exactly, and, in Florida. Yeah. Uh, but here's what I heard from Rick. Uh, Dick. Uh, Rick is in the wheelchair. Yeah. He, he was talking on a computer to the doctors who uh -huh. were there at the you know sports clinic. And the, his mother got up and said, the reason he started getting active was when he was a child, he wanted his body to move, but he didn't have the means. Mm -hmm. So he would allow his siblings mm -hmm. to use him as mm -hmm. a football mm -hmm. in the front yard. Mm -hmm. and, and he goes typing like this, mm -hmm. I like to move. Mm -hmm. oh. and, and it just mm -hmm. struck, struck me, we all like yeah. to move. Mm -hmm. Some of us don't move very fast, but it, it was, just an eye opener. There's a lady who's uh, racing this weekend, and I think she's in her 30s, and she's uh, pulling her, her sister who has cerebral palsy. So, JR, other thoughts that have come up? Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And, it's, and Michael, it's such an incredible history. isn't it great to see so much energy in your parents and stuff? I love it. I think you know. I'm not sure how to respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> and we're holding our breaths. That, right. No, I, 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 I am, I'm waiting to to one day wake up with all the energy that my parents show every day, and it hasn't happened yet, so. Oh, it's, I'll tell you what, it's, it's very special to always be around you. I have a question. Yeah, Lotus? What does it feel like when you're standing there and you're watching people go through the Iron Man shoot, knowing that it was your idea? Do you ever really feel it? I don't. I, I, I feel quite detached because really? we started as a way to separate our talents, you might call them, from the sprinters. And now the endurance athletes are sprinters. So I, I don't feel, I, I don't identify with it. You know, this is a, it's a whole different crowd. But in terms of endurance, you were the first uh, female to swim from Lanai to, to, Maui. to Maui. Yes, yes. And that was because two, two male bachelor swimmers were hoping that it would generate enough publicity on Mother's Day that they would get some dates. <laughs> <laughs> so, and she did get bitten by a shark. <laughs> the shark nibble, nibble, nibble. The shark was only about three inches long. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there's another point I wanted to make about... Uh, the Honolulu Marathon. Uh, Jack Scaff used to give a little talk Remember before that, it yeah. started. And the other day I found one of the marathon entry forms and, and was glad to see at the bottom what had inspired us to do the event. It gave the finish time for the prior year for the first athlete and the last athlete. Uh -huh. And it said, you are cordially invited to break the record at either end. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Is, doesn't that make you? Yeah, I always say Herb and I are the reason that there's a cutoff time in the Iron Man. So. <laughs> no, it's only a coincidence that the cutoff time is within 21 seconds of my first finish time. Oh, then I think you're the reason. <laughs> oh, my not gosh. I think you are. Bob so. Babbitt called the other day to ask uh, what time sunrise was on the second year. And he said, and we called Michael, and Michael said, I know exactly when the event started in 1979. Tell them why. This was news to me. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't recognize the lead-in. Okay, okay, the lead-in has to do with trying to verify that you finished in the daytime and knowing what time you finished for sure. Oh, that's because the second year was a year of very, very bad weather, and so we did not start on Saturday as we'd intended. And we woke up on Sunday and my father, the race director, looked out the window and saw the trees blowing sideways and said, this is not happening today. Michael, go back to sleep. And so they went down to tell everybody else that the race wasn't going to happen at 7 o'clock like it was supposed to. And I got, a, I, I got a telephone call from my mother from a payphone downtown at 7.30 saying, they're going to do the race anyway. If you can get here by 8, I think I can hold the start until you get here. <laughs> so I did this. I started at 8 o'clock, and my goal had been to actually go to school the next day. And school started at 8, and, the, and my homeroom class got out at 8.25. And so as the day wore on and on and on, 
I just wanted to finish before my homeroom class got out, and I missed it by 58 seconds. That's a great point. But Judy found it very easy to put the start off until 8 because our boat was supposed to come around from the North Shore and the waves were too high and they wouldn't bring the boat. So Judy went to the Outrigger Canoe Club and smooth talked them into furnishing a boat. And they said, when do you want it? She said, 8 o'clock. <laughs> and that was so... Whatever the bridge Michael, director does, As baby. a mother... <laughs> Whatever's going on. I would have heard about it for the rest of my life uh -huh. if I hadn't allowed Michael to get down to the start. It's John and Judy Collins we've been speaking with, and you can catch their show uh, last week. The in-depth uh, show lots of stories that are different from today's stories. So John and Judy Collins, uh, co-founders of the island back in 1978 on Oahu, it was moved over here by Valerie Silk. Uh, they had the Nautilus Fitness Center at the time, and when Valerie and her husband separated, he got the Nautilus Fitness Center, and she got been a sponsor of it, and she the got race. the shoebox uh, history of the Ironman, and I'm glad that Herb and I got so involved with her back in those days, and were able to contribute, I think, significantly, significantly to many things. Michael Collins has also been with us, this, their son, he's going to be doing the race this weekend, he does it every five years, so he's an old hat, I don't think he ever gets to the old hat. And also with us is uh, J.R. John DeGroote from West Hawaii today, someone I've known since he was a little kid, which is great to watch, see his byline, and what a great writer he's become. And um, also Lotus Gold, who knows an Iron Man finisher, and just really wanted to meet uh, John and Judy and spend some time with us, so we, we appreciate her uh, videotaping for us. And anybody has some last thoughts they'd like to give to our listeners? Um. No, I'm, I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's Wednesday now, and the race is Saturday. I'm starting to think all about me now. Okay. <laughs> That's a great answer. And I'm saying, sorry, Big Island, that we that we make it so hard to get about in the car this week, but thank you so much for this beautiful setting. And boy, the Big Island residents uh, deserve a lot of uh, thank yous oh, for yes. everybody putting up with it you know, as they try to get to and from work and everything else. Well, new life goal, we marched in the parade last night, and the goal used to involve doing the event. I'm down, down to the point, my life goal is now to come back for the 50th and still be able to walk in the parade. Okay. <laughs> we discussed that. Okay. Well, I'll tell All you right. what, it, it's with the energy you've got now and everything, and we'll JR, some there. last thoughts? <laughs> last thoughts during this No, it's just a tremendous honor to meet you guys. And I've been seeing this event since I was born. I mean, I've been here 24 years, and thank you very much for it. And it's a great honor to be covering it now. Yeah, it's fun, so to, for, fun for me, too, to spend some time with JR and... Uh, uh, his mom has been a great friend and a great supporter and really been helpful to oh, me over the One day so. J.R. will get the buck yeah. and, and, and be a part of the parade, which is well, he the did, big Well, J.R. did a lot to get inline hockey going here on the islands. Or really? Oh, yeah. Well, he's done it professionally. And, and uh, those kids, that they did it for so many years. And a uh, beautiful rink over here at our uh, Maka'ea walking, jogging path. So there's uh, many, many hundreds of kids and, and teenagers that went on to college, too, playing some inline hockey and scholarships. and. So JR was one of those guys. So thanks, everyone. It's the Emily T. Gale Show on ESPNHawaii.com. You can also get the free podcast at iTunes and um, or on Facebook. And I really thank everyone for all your nice comments. And to all you Detroiters, you know, we, we talk about the Detroit biking, the Tour de Trois, five, 6,000 bikers uh, taking a tour of Detroit a couple weeks ago, the Monday night slow rides, five or 600 participants on Monday nights through the streets of Detroit. I was on and one where last month. Where start? In Detroit. This I is know, but where, where oh, are every week, We go up every to Oshkosh, Monday. you know, about right, once a year. This is in the downtown area, downtown Detroit. Every okay. Monday it's a different uh, venue where they start and they ride through the city streets, oh, which are very wide. Oh, that's hard when you come into town. Isn't yeah, it? but I can, I can lead you. We'll keep in touch. But the beauty of it is that people come from Michigan and, and all the cities, San Diego, Las, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, New York, to come ride along the ocean. And people that are from Hawaii and stuff go to the cities to ride. I mean, it's just great that biking is such an integral part of living, whether you live in Hawaii or you live in downtown Detroit. And uh, I also want to thank all my Detroit listeners and the comments you make and uh, all your support of the Emily T. Gale Show. And go Detroit Tigers! <laughs> Aloha! The Emily T. Gale Show here on ESPNHawaii.com. Okay. Thanks, guys. Yes. Well, we 